was in 1947 and 1949, we passed the National Security Act and the CIA Act. And those two acts in combination allowed money to be clawed out of the federal government and federal budget and spent in non-transparent ways. So we, we created a secret way of funding very big projects through, through the governmental mechanism. It all comes back to a point after World War II where literally the government lost control of the technology. We had the most powerful, secretive, black technology in the world, including some that we brought over from the Nazis. And, and a lot of what we're dealing with goes back to the fact that we've had since then 50 to 60 years of incredible non-transparent governmental flows going into basically corporate controlled technology that many of us don't understand. Apple, Microsoft, and Tesla. All three have been on a roll since mid-June. New concerns tonight about the social media giant's role in fake news and elections. These firms have too much power, our economy, and democracy. Everything they're doing online is being watched, is being tracked. Every single action you take is carefully monitored and recorded. Their personal data, which is like gold. We have this trusted digital Identity built. Ja, en bij mij gingen er heel veel vraagtekens. Wat is een digitale portemonnee? Ten of the 17 sustainable development goals cannot be met without first closing the identity gap. Digital identity is an absolute horror. Das kommende Jahrzehnt muss Europas digital decade sein. We won't be able to do that with traditional systems. The regulation for the EU digital COVID certificate. Vote is closed and it is adopted. The passport infrastructure is in place. You bring in that digital currency and you've got this total control. What happened? Where is the critique of capitalism itself, which has led to a system of horrendous inequality? Across the globe, our identity is being traded for billions of dollars. How is it possible that something so seemingly elusive as our data has so much value? Data is the new gold, and this is the gold rush. But what does that mean for us? What does it mean for our privacy and for our freedom? Wrapped in a veil of marketing, grand narratives and noble causes, we are presented with a future which may be less rosy than it appears. The next web is one of the world's leading tech events. One of the speakers is the former CIA and NSA contractor, Edward Snowden. In 2013, he blew the whistle on the large-scale spy activities that the U.S. government conducted on citizens and governments worldwide. His message is clear. The idea that there was a system of global mass surveillance in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, right? The media treated this possibility as a conspiracy theory because they could not see why. When we got the evidence, things quickly began to change, but what threats are we missing today? Um, and I think when we look at what's happening as like uh, these post-pandemic restrictions, uh, everybody closes borders instantly, then you've got to install apps and like all of these different changes. And then just a few years later, you've got in China, 25 million people in the city of Shanghai who are not allowed to leave their apartments, who are not allowed to even order groceries. Like if you couldn't leave your apartment and you couldn't order groceries right now, how long would you last? I think this is where we are moving toward a moment in history right now uh, that we all feel things are going wrong. Everybody sees like the plate beginning to slip in slow motion. We're all reaching it to try to catch it. Um, but if we had known that plate was going to fall, we would have a better chance uh, to catch it. And I, I, I am worried 
that the plate is going to break. Uh, banks are, are the biggest example right now where, you know, they, they can cut you off at any moment. You have your money uh, in their hand and they're supposed to, uh, you know, be good stewards of it. But we have begun to see people dislocated from their accounts because of protest activity, right? Because of the movements they support. Uh, but governments realize they have new tools that they've never had before. When there is such a popularity, when there is such a dependence on a certain structure, on a certain network, how do we leave it? How do we depart it? How do we progress from it? How do we recognize that the system as it exists today is not good enough? And to recognize that it could be better, and to recognize that it should be better, and to recognize that individually and collectively we can make it better. But it will not become better unless we force that to happen. I don't mean violently. This can be achieved nonviolently. And I think this is both the great challenge and the great hope of our time. And we are being asked by history in this moment right now, what are we going to do with it? Spearheading these developments is the digital identity. The digital ID industry is a booming business. According to analysts, its potential revenue is $30 billion in 2024 which could rise to 50 billion in 2026. It should come as no surprise that big tech corporations like Microsoft, IBM and MasterCard are heavily represented in the lobby for a global system of digital IDs. Jedes Mal, wenn eine Website uns auffordert, eine neue digitale Identität zu erstellen oder uns bequem über eine große Plattform anzumelden, haben wir in Wirklichkeit keine Ahnung, was eigentlich mit unseren Daten passiert. Und das muss aufhören. Und aus diesem Grund wird die Kommission demnächst eine sichere europäische digitale Identität vorschlagen. Eine, der wir vertrauen und die Bürgerinnen und Bürger überall in Europa nutzen können, um alles zu tun, vom Steuerzahlen bis zum Fahrradmieten. Eine Technologie, bei der wir selbst kontrollieren können, welche Daten ausgetauscht und wie sie verwendet werden. Arno Vellens ist ein Autor und investigative Journalist, spezialisiert in Finance. Für sein Buch, The Euro Gospel, hat er sich in die Politikmachung von einer expandierenden Europa verwandelt. Vellens hält ein wachsendes Auge auf den Progress der europäischen Digital ID. Hoe het praktisch eruit ziet, de Digital Identity Wallet, is dat jij straks een appje hebt op je telefoon. En um, daarin zitten eigenlijk al jouw wachtwoorden en je rijbewijs, bankafschriften en elektronisch patiëntendossier. Dat zit allemaal in één appje. De Europese Commissie heeft gezegd, nou, wij, wij komen met een toolkit in het najaar van, uh, van 2022. En daar zitten alle elementen in en alle eisen en de middelen uh, van hoe dat er specifiek uit moet komen te zien. Maar mensen krijgen straks een app op hun telefoon waarmee ze zowel in social media als met hun bank, als met mail, als met de overheid kunnen communiceren en hun vaccinatiebewijs kunnen, kunnen tonen. Dat is hoe het er praktisch uitziet. A European digital ID is in the works for every EU citizen. An app will enable us to identify ourselves with our smartphone and choose which personal data we wish to share, both online and offline with government institutions and private companies throughout the European Union. A so-called digital wallet will enable various attributes to be incorporated into it, such as government records, insurance documents, travel documents, personal data such as social media accounts, bank records, diplomas, credit card records, medical records and vaccination status. As founder of Privacy First, Bas Filippini keeps track of all digital identity developments. Kom ik uit de uh, tijd van idee, plicht, nee. En we zitten nu al in de fase waarin we dus hebben over digital ID, waar al die informatie op staat. En met uitsluitingsmogelijkheden om deel te nemen in het sociaal maatschappelijk verkeer naar een stuk. Helemaal de foute dingen. Maar het kwam ook omdat ik langere termijn kijk. En ik zag het al aankomen. 
Feitelijk is de digitale identiteit natuurlijk te verzorgen dat jij beheer en beschikking hebt over je eigen data. En een stuk gemak over dat je niet al die pasjes no nodig hebt en dat je eigenlijk met één drager jezelf uh, kan identificeren en door de maatschappij kan bewegen. Is daar iets mis mee? Nou, nee, want het is heel erg handig. Hè? Want als je dat in je, in je wallet stopt, op je iPhone, op je smartphone, dan geeft dat enorm veel voordelen. Ken van Eerland is een digital entrepreneur en big data specialist. Hij assist large tech companies met hun digital transformation processes en knows de waarde van data like no other. Ik was laatst in Sevilla, wilde ik een elektrische fiets huren. En toen moest ik door tal van applicaties stappen om uiteindelijk na een uur dat ik gebruik kon maken van die fiets. Terwijl als ze hadden gebruik gemaakt van de wallet waar al deze informatie had dat in 10 seconden had dat gekund. Digital identity gives us a prospect of convenience, security, and economic progress. But at the same time, there are grave concerns, such as here in Frankfurt, where people are worried about their privacy, safety, and freedom. By connecting every citizen's data, it would be technologically feasible to surveil, manipulate, and exclude people from society on a large scale. Thus, in the wrong hands, This could become the ultimate means of control. During the 2020 pandemic, we saw how such means can be used to exclude people from society. The plans for a digital ID have been around for much longer, but the corona crisis gave governments free reign to fast track a QR code ID system as part of the digital COVID certificate. Toen werd op een gegeven moment gezegd, nou ja, dus als je gevaccineerd bent, of je hebt een herstelbewijs, of je hebt een testbewijs, dan, als je aan een van die drie voorwaarden doet, krijg je een coronacertificaat. En met dat, alleen, alleen met dat certificaat mag je een café in, mag je een bioscoop in, mag je het zwembad in. Daar werd dus eigenlijk een soort digitaal poortje gecreëerd. En dat digitale poortje kon je alleen maar door als je dat bewijs had. Timon Wisman teaches privacy and data protection law at the VU University of Amsterdam and is chairman of the platform for civil rights. During the pandemic, Wisman expressed serious concerns about the introduction of the Dutch government's 2G policy. 2G meant that only recovered or vaccinated people were allowed to visit public places such as restaurants, cafes or swimming pools. Daar waar de risico's op besmetting op besmetting het allergrootst zijn. De volle kroeg, de festivals, de evenementen, overal waar mensen bovenop elkaar staan. Daar wordt het mogelijk om alleen mensen toegang te geven die gevaccineerd zijn of genezen van corona. Ofwel de 2G aanpak die we ook in steeds meer landen om ons heen zien. Getest, die derde G, getest kom je dan niet meer binnen. En het werd dus gestimuleerd om je te vaccineren. En uiteindelijk uh, is er een uh, rapport uitgekomen van de TU Delft... waarin werd aangegeven, dit, wer dit werkt helemaal niet. Maar toch gingen we ermee door. In januari 2022, de Technical University of Delft... stated that the Dutch COVID pass was not functioning as planned. Their research, commissioned by the Dutch Ministry of Health... showed that the 2G and 3G policies contributed little... to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Je ziet dat mensen bereid zijn om, ook al is een bepaald beleid inmiddels achterhaald door de wetenschap, dat mensen toch gewoon blijven gehoorzamen aan die technocratische uitsluitingsregimes die zijn uh, gecreëerd. Maar je creëert daar wel een hele gekke samenleving mee. Want de gehoorzamen mogen blijven meedoen en de mensen die kritische noten plaatsen, die worden langzaam eigenlijk uit de samenleving uh, en uit de structuren van de samenleving geweerd. En daarnaast maak je dus ook burgers handhavers. Dan wordt nu opeens de burger die staat, uh, die staat bij het voetbalveld te controleren of jij wel uh, je, je, je stippeltje hebt in de buitenlucht. Ik vind niet dat je op zo'n manier een, uh, een samenleving moet inrichten. Ik vind, dat, ik vind de QR-samenleving een fundamenteel verkeerde keuze. We 
We were called, I think it was month of March 2021, if I'm not mistaken. We were told that we have to vote on an urgent procedure to pass the COVID certificate. And uh, I asked, why do we have to do this? Because an urgent procedure means that we will not have debate. We will not have access to many informations. There will not be a lot of discussions. We will just vote on something that we don't see. You know, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable, you know, to vote on something that I don't know. Well, you know, you're asking too many questions. Anyway, we have a majority. Then I said, I'm not, I can't vote for this. Christian Teres is a Euro parliamentarian who, together with other members of parliament, actively opposed the introduction of the Green Certificate in the European Union. Terhej is of the opinion that, foremost, more transparency is needed concerning the contracts for the purchases of 1.8 billion vaccines, a deal that Ursula von der Leyen personally negotiated with Pfizer. The European Court of Auditors also requested an explanation, to no avail. It wanted to know how the contracts came about, on the basis of what scientific evidence and of what conditions. But von der Leyen refused to share the text messages that she sent to Pfizer's CEO. So after a lot of pressure in the parliament, as the article says, these contracts were disclosed to us and to the public. And I want to show you some of those pages. And you tell me if this is okay for the European citizens to be exposed to this situation where they cannot come to work, they cannot enter a store, they cannot go with their kids to schools, where they cannot freely move from one country to another, unless in one situation is vaccinated with one of these products. So these are the contracts. These are the pages. In a, in a free society, freedom, liberty is the rule. So you see how they change the, the relationship now. Now in order for you to freely move, you have to explain or you have to show certain things in order to have the privilege to freely move. But COVID is an infectious disease, right? So it's... Well, it is, but everything that they've done had nothing to do with COVID. COVID was just a pretext. But what I know for a fact from different sources inside of the European Commission is that even before the the green certificate was approved initially by the European Parliament. They already, the Commission was already talking to certain companies, you know, to build up the infrastructure. And here is mine. So everyone who is fully vaccinated or tested negative or has recovered from COVID can get one. The idea for a digital ID originated before 2011. The OECD, an organization with 38 member states, set up to stimulate economic progress and world trade, wrote a report that advised governments to adopt a digital ID strategy. And in 2017, the European Commission released its first action plan for the creation of an e-government with a digital ID for all Europeans. Het eerste wat we gedaan werd, er moest een app komen. Nou, ik heb ook nog in, de, in die commissie uh, gezeten over uh, de app. Waarom moet er überhaupt een app komen? En wij waren als Privacy First, waren we dat principieel tegen. Maar dat is gewoon doorgedrukt. Nou, veel langer waren ze al bezig met die app. En hiermee kon een versnelling gecreëerd worden. Dus, en die app is in feite al een eerste stap naar Digital ID. Nou, dan is het nog maar een kleine stap om daar wat de gegevens aan toe te voegen. Dat gaat natuurlijk van kwaad naar erger. En zo is in feite COVID misbruikt als een soort social credit systeem, ook meteen binnen die app. Want je werd uitgesloten als je niet het juiste gedrag vertoonde. Maar mensen een... zullen altijd zeggen, van, ja, we leven toch in een democratie. Een, een nou, social we hebben credit dus gezien... systeem zal hier nooit komen. Nee, maar uh, we zien al dat we erheen gaan. En ik vind de COVID pas, was stap 1 binnen een democratie, uh, hoe ver je eigenlijk al kan gaan. The Green Certificate kind of educated people to use a QR code to show that they were vaccinated when they entered a store. Now you have the digital wallet. They say right now that is not mandatory, right now. But they might pass a law, for example, that will say, well, it's not mandatory, but if you don't have it, you cannot do certain things.
James Corbett is an investigative journalist and documentary filmmaker. In his renowned documentary, How Big Oil Conquered the World, he shows how, worldwide, sovereignty is increasingly being lost to technocratic forces. According to Corbett, we are entering a new era of extensive governmental control. There are different paradigms that we enter into as history unfolds and as different um, events take place. And I think for the past couple of decades, certainly the terrorist events of September 11, 2001 was used as one of those paradigms of control of society and was used as the excuse for the implementation of all sorts of measures that would not have been um, doable, really, without the, that, uh, that justification, that presumed justification. In response to the attack on the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001, George W. Bush signed the Patriot Act, a controversial bill that would make it easier for the American intelligence agencies to surveil and eavesdrop on citizens on a large scale. The act was to be temporary, but this act has been extended to date in modified form and also has implications for American companies beyond the national borders of the U.S. Today we take an essential step in defeating terrorism while protecting the constitutional rights of all Americans. With my signature, this law will give intelligence and law enforcement officials important new tools to fight a present danger. What we have seen over the past couple of years is the rollout of the next iteration of the paradigm of, of governance uh, for the planet, which is the biosecurity paradigm. It is now not in the name of some turbaned boogeyman hiding behind some corner who wants to blow you up. Now it's the virus that's hiding behind some corner and wants to infect you. And one of the obvious techno-solutionism answers to this problem is the COVID passports, the vaccine certificates. The specter of this was floated almost immediately in the wake of the lockdowns and other things that we saw in March of 2020. So the vaccine passport becomes the Trojan horse to the digital identification. Once people get used to the idea that they're going to have to present their vaccine passport in order to be allowed to travel to a different country or even to travel to a different region within their own country or even to go shopping, then it isn't a large step to say, okay, well, now we are going to implement that exact infrastructure for all access to all government services, access to leave your home, and people will be more willing to accept it. So it seems that the COVID pandemic has opened the doors to a new era, an era in which control and surveillance are facilitated and further normalized. A digital ID to which all our data is linked seems to be the ultimate means to this end. But the question arises, where does this push towards the centralization of our data stem from? And whom does it benefit? There zijn, there zijn twee redenen om dit te willen. Uh, en de, de ene kant is omdat er handel zit in jouw data. Want als al jouw data aan elkaar gekoppeld zijn, dan kunnen uh, analisten die kunnen kijken wat jij allemaal uitgeeft, hoe jij te beïnvloeden bent. Er zijn mensen die, die uh, jouw bestedingspatroon en jouw eetpatroon willen koppelen aan medisch onderzoek. En uh, dat heet een European Union Data Space. En daar zitten gewoon alle gegevens van mensen in. En al die plannen liggen er al. Daar zit een hele industrie achter. De bedrijven die die appjes bouwen bijvoorbeeld. The French defense and tech company, Thales, is one of the corporations that is involved with the development of the EU digital wallet. Hello everyone. Meet Lucy, student in psychology. And me, her digital ID wallet issued by the government to offer a wide range of identity services. In fact... I am a handy way of proving and protecting her identity, both online and face-to-face. -face. Let's have a closer look at what I can do. I can help governments to better communicate with citizens. Right now, I'm reminding Lucy of the appointment she needs to schedule for her mandatory vaccination. Gratische lobby vanuit techbedrijven. En... Heel groot. Het gaat om geld. De hele digitalisering uh, wordt aangejaagd door big tech. Kijk, die overheid heeft een ruif van duizenden miljarden die ze ter beschikking stellen om idealen na te streven die zij graag voor hem willen bouwen tegen woekerprijzen. 
En dat zie je dus ook in het hele vraagstuk rondom digitalisering. Is dat die overheid ziet dat als je dat op een centrale manier dat kan gaan inrichten. Dan zie je dat al die Franse Duitse bedrijven die zeggen wauw dat is geweldig. Want het zijn miljarden projecten. Daar worden honderden miljarden geïnvesteerd om een platform te creëren. Om het identity van 500 miljoen Europese burgers vast te leggen. En om daarmee ook een hele workflow te bouwen van uh, wieg tot graf. Om je daarin te gaan besturen. Vanuit het surveillance capitalism uh, is er natuurlijk een soort van gratis model ontstaan op internet... om consumenten bij jouw dienst aan te laten sluiten. De stap die daarna is gekomen is manipulatie van, van die gegevens... om jou te bewegen in een richting waar je nog helemaal niet aan gedacht had. Totdat deze stroming gecombineerd werd met politiek. En daarbij zie je dat hey, als wij gedrag kunnen... Manip voorspellen en manipuleren van consumenten. En dan kunnen we dat ook wellicht doen van kiezers. Nou, en die hele uh, efficiënte manier om te sturen... Ja, is natuurlijk de droom van elk groot bedrijf. Ik denk dat we de drive kunnen zien naar een digitale identificatie... Coming through a number of groups that are identifiable, that have identifiable memberships. You could look, for example, to ID2020 Alliance and its founding partners, including Microsoft and Accenture and the Rockefeller Foundation and Gavi the Vaccine Alliance. Or you could look at something like uh, ID4D, the World Bank project, which uh, boasts among its membership the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the uh, Omidyar Network, the UK government, NORAD, which uh, is attempting to introduce identification for development. Across the globe, we see a range of large NGOs cooperating with governments and central banks to develop the digital ID. Such as the ID4D initiative, a project of the World Bank, and the ID2020 alliance, a partnership between mainly big tech companies such as Microsoft and Accenture, and philanthropic foundations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Nou, wat je ziet achter de digitale identiteit is de industrie. Dat is een heel duidelijk verhaal. En de industrie heeft een nieuwe truc gevonden, namelijk zich voordoen als NGO. Daarmee komen ze in feite heel onafhankelijk over, maar het is een dekmantel, zou je het kunnen noemen. En dat zie je dus, de World Economic Forum, je ziet ID2020 projecten, Gavi... Uh, en nog een aantal van dat soort dingen. En wie zit er daar dan achter? Ik kom elke keer dezelfde namen tegen. Maar het is in feite een verzameling van uh, Big Tech, Big Finance, uh, Big Pharma, Big Media. I think the idea of the nation state as the organizing principle for power in the world is a, an increasingly antiquated notion since the founding of the post-World War II order. In uh, regional groupings that are increasingly, I think, openly and, and uh, undeniably controlled by transnational interests of multinational corporations, financial interests, um, NGOs of various sorts. And we see that reflected in the membership of these various digital identity alliances. One of the largest and most influential NGOs is the World Economic Forum. Founded by the German engineer and economist Klaus Schwab. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to participate for the eighth time at this important meeting. The World Economic Forum is a lobby organization known mostly for its annual gathering in Davos, Switzerland, which is attended by 3,000 paying members and selected participants, among them investors, CEOs, and political leaders. In de politiek wordt ontkend dat zij grote invloed hebben. Hoe in hoeverre is dat waar? Nou, dat klopt natuurlijk niet. Uh, een lobbypartij heeft altijd invloed. De lobbyisten lopen in en uit in Brussel. En dat geldt ook in de Verenigde Staten. Dus dat ze geen invloed zouden hebben, dat vind ik echt puur naïviteit. Vervolgens zijn er natuurlijk brieven, ook naar buiten gekomen, door WOP-verzoeken, waarin heel duidelijk wordt gezegd, uh, neem een voorbeeld van de minister Kaag, u doet mee aan deze werkgroep, strictly of the record. Waarom strictly of the record? In december 2021, the Dutch government made binding agreements with the World Economic Forum. Namely, the execution of projects launched by the World Economic Forum. Such as the Food Innovation Hubs, a network for global food innovation. 
so the World Economic Forum can initiate specific public-private partnerships in the Netherlands. And the Dutch government directly adopts policy goals from the World Economic Forum. One of the ways the World Economic Forum influences governments is the publication of research papers. It is common for these to be copied directly into the policy directives of governments. In 2016, the World Economic Forum published the report A Blueprint for Digital Identity. Stakeholders worked on the research for 12 months, among them ID2020 Alliance, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Mastercard, Visa, Deloitte, the ING Bank and the Dutch Civil Service, DigiD. Uit hun jaarrekening blijkt dat ze elk jaar zo'n 370 miljoen euro krijgen. En daarvan gaat 40 miljoen euro op aan die conferentie waarbij al die mensen klimaatneutraal met hun privé naar Davos vliegen. En de rest gaat gewoon op aan het maken van die rapporten. En die rapporten die zijn 100% gefinancierd door die grote multinationals die er belang bij hebben dat die boodschap wordt verspreid. Dus het is een heel groot lobbybureau. En dan kun je je afvragen, ja, hoe omvangrijk is het? Hoe... Invloedrijk is het? Nou, in de jaarrekening van het World Economic Forum staat dat zij een, een actiecommissie hebben. En dat zien zij als een ministerie van Buitenlandse Zaken van het World Economic Forum. Zo heet dat ook. Dat kan rechtshandelingen verrichten. Dat kan contracten sluiten met de Nederlandse overheid. Als er een geschil ontstaat, dan is niet de Nederlandse overheid het hoogste gezag. Maar dan moet er naar een internationaal tribunaal worden gegaan. Een, een, een arbitragecommissie. Dus de regering uh, die accepteert dat World Economic Forum gewoon als een contractpartner. De vraag die je moet stellen is, is het gezond dat een groep bedrijven zoveel invloed heeft op het beleid van de regering? En dat betekent eigenlijk, we hebben geen tegenmacht internationaal op industriële belangengroepen. En daarmee zie je dat ze uh, ja, in feite de macht pakken en het geld pakken. Maar als je met bedrijven te maken hebt, dan belangengroepen die tien keer de grootte hebben van jouw nationale economie en macht... En relaties wereldwijd. Ja, dan ben jij kansloos uh, als land. In februari 2021, the Dutch ruling coalition presented a policy letter concerning digital ID. In this letter, the Dutch Secretary of State refers to two reports: one by the World Economic Forum and one by McKinsey. The World Economic Forum mentions three causes for the rollout of the digital ID: the prevention of an exponential growth of various login data the lack of control over user data and that 70% of European citizens do not finalize their online purchases causing a loss of potential revenue for web stores. The McKinsey report indicates that digital ID would offer economic opportunities but this is based on research done in various developing countries such as Nigeria, India and Ethiopia. So in the end Its economic rationale appears flawed. Die webwinkels, Amazon, Bol.com, die en hun lobbyisten, die hebben berekend via een Deens bedrijf dat er voor 4 triljoen dollar per jaar aan impulsaankopen niet doorgaat. En dat komt als jij op je telefoon zit, hè? als jij een reclame ziet, dan gebeurt het heel vaak dat mensen moeten inloggen. Ze moeten een paar stappen doen vanaf het zien van de reclame tot de daadwerkelijke betaling waarmee de koop definitief is. En dat zou makkelijker gaan als wij een digitale identiteit hebben die gelijk is op al onze devices. En dat is de enige economische wetenschappelijke onderbouwing die de regering aan de Nederlandse Kamer kan presenteren. Dus dat wij meer impulsaankopen gaan doen zodat de economie stijgt. Dat is winst voor de grote bedrijven, voor Amazon, Bol.com. En dat wordt gepresenteerd als een winst voor burgers. En daarom wordt dat gedaan. Ik, ik, ik heb het idee dat... Dat we steeds minder democratisch worden. Dat we het democratische gehalte van de Europese samenleving steeds meer ten doel komt van een kleine groep. En dat, het, dat we democratisch niet meer gehoord worden, dat er voor ons beslist wordt. Door mensen die, um, die niet democratisch gekozen zijn. De vrouw van der Leyen is benoemd en is niet gekozen. Frans Timmermans is niet gekozen, hij is benoemd. Dus al die mensen, al die commissarissen die er zitten, ook die grappenmaker, die voormalige CEO van Atos, die benoemd is tot Eurocommissaris voor digitalisering, is gewoon benoemd. En die mensen die bepalen wel ons leven. Dat is gevaarlijk. Everybody is pretending that we live in a democratic process, but we are not. 
where you have some people in power, usually unelected people, unelected bureaucrats who are not answering to anybody. On top of that, they are lacking any kind of transparency. You know, everything is segmented. You just see, you know, a proposal comes on your desk and usually there are backdoor deals before a proposal come, come to us. And seeing what was happening, for example, with the green certificate, what is happening now with many other things where there's clearly lacking any, any kind of transparency, this is a problem. Christian Terhej grew up in Romania during Nicolae Ceausescu's oppressive regime that lasted from 1967 to 1989. With the corona measures, such as the introduction of the European Green Certificate, Terhej is very concerned about what are to him recognizable patterns. Everybody in Romania was, was under severe distress back then and uh, fighting for, for pretty much for survival because they rationalized food, they rationalized electricity, they rationalized gas. If you dare to complain or to oppose, for example, what was happening, you were immediately persecuted by the Secret Service. Seeing what is happening right now all across Europe, especially now being a member of the European Parliament, I don't want that experience again by Western Europeans in this case, and this is the reason why I'm heavily fighting for fundamental rights, for freedom and liberty. We're sort of at a knife edge at the moment. Um, if we carry on going down the same path that we've been become used to, and younger generations just take for granted, I think we are all going to be absolutely royally screwed, privacy-wise, human rights-wise, um, even democratically. Annie Machon is a former employee of the British intelligence agency MI5. In 1997, she and her ex-partner David Shaler became whistleblowers by lifting the veil on large-scale illegal spying by British intelligence agencies. Among other things, David Shaler revealed to the newspaper The Mail on Sunday that in 1996, the British Secret Service paid £160,000 to various terrorist organizations with the goal of assassinating Muammar Gaddafi, then leader of Libya. A number of his bodyguards were killed in the assassination attempt. Knowing the paper was about to publish, Machon and Shaler decided to escape to Europe. If you're traveling around Europe and you know that MI5 and the secret police are hot on your trail, because we've been on the inside, we knew all the tricks of what they could do in order to trace us. You had to pay everything in cash, you couldn't use ATMs, you couldn't book hotel chains because they could find out through those systems. So it's very much a case of just getting on a train with no warning, not prepaying for any tickets, um, disguising ourselves. So we keep moving around, moving around all the time. After what Machon had seen and experienced, she became an author, activist and public speaker. With her knowledge of data security, she fights for more privacy and security online. What we are effectively facing um, to our lives online are um, a number of key threats. One, of course, is the intelligence agencies, the sort of state level national actors that have this panoptic power to scoop up all our information globally. There's also the other threat from corporate spy companies. Um, I suppose the most notorious over the last few months was something called Pegasus. Pegasus is spyware developed by the Israeli cyber defense company, NSO Group. It is capable of being remotely installed without a trace, for instance via a missed call on WhatsApp, and offers complete access to every smartphone or computer. Pegasus was used for spying on activists, journalists and political leaders from various countries across the globe, and is still being used worldwide to this day. And then I think the third vulnerability for us when it comes to privacy, we the people living our lives online, would be what I call the data farming, the data harvesting, which is what the big corporations do. They monetize our data. I mean, most people are aware of that aspect. Um, but the sheer extent of how that could be micromanaged and microanalyzed, I think has only become more obvious to some people over the last few years. In March 2018, the social media platform Facebook landed itself in hot water after sharing its users' personal data on a large scale. In collusion with British political consultancy, Cambridge Analytica, the personal data was used to manipulate the 2016 US presidential elections and the Brexit referendum with highly specific targeting and misinformation. 
Tonight, Mark Zuckerberg once again facing skeptical lawmakers, pushing him on Facebook's failure to protect its users' private information. It seems as though you turned a blind, blind eye to this, correct? Congressman, I disagree with that assessment. Never before in history had personal data been abused on such a large scale. And so authorities agreed that this should never happen again. The other issue around the spies and the corporate spies is they can't even protect their cyber weapons that they used to do their spying with, which means that they can fall into the dark web and be used by criminal hackers. So you have a situation where even the CIA and the NSA cannot protect their own classified information. And that's why I would suggest that things like um, digital ID is counterintuitive to everything I've been talking about for the last 25 years. Because effectively what we're doing is we're handing over, um, for convenience, the concept of our personal identity. You can just plug into all your government services and they say it's going to be private, but can they guarantee it? Because who is going to own the hardware on which it's stored? Who is going to run the software which runs it and, and organises it? Who is going to own the infrastructure, you know, even the fibre optic cables going across the Atlantic or across the Pacific? So I don't trust our governments or our institutions to be savvy enough to protect um, that sort of very private information, which would be our whole scope of us online, and, and do it in a meaningful manner. Our data has never been safe online. History teaches us that it is nearly impossible to protect citizens from hackers, corporations and governments themselves. And yet we are meant to believe that the digital ID will offer a safe solution for all our centralized data. Je hebt straks één plek waar alle digitale buit zit samengebald. Dus je hebt één slot, de vos, die moet maar één slot openbreken en dan heeft hij alle kippen bij elkaar. Alle digitale kippen. En dat, dat is een enorm gevaar hiervan. Privacy is an important aspect of our online security. But as soon as money is linked to the digital ID, it becomes a completely different story. Because if it were possible to exclude people from the payment systems, then this could be abused as the ultimate means of control. Then a so-called social credit system doesn't seem so far off. Since late 2020, more than 100 central banks worldwide, among them the ECB and Federal Reserve, have started extensive research into the development of a CBDC, a central bank digital currency. A digital currency issued by the central banks. In countries including Canada, France, Saudi Arabia and China, pilot projects have already started. And in Jamaica and the Bahamas, the CBDC is already being issued. Mahir Alkaya is Member of Parliament for the Dutch Socialist Party and Rapporteur of Central Digital Bank Money for the Dutch House of Representatives. Ever since he became a parliamentarian, he has fought for more expertise regarding digital money. Now that the central bank digital currency is on the horizon, he is concerned about the technical decisions made by the ECB. Het uh, ontwerpen van munten en biljetten, dat was tot daaraan toe, maar het ontwerpen van echte digitale geld, dat heeft echt verstrekkende consequenties, moet dat ook zomaar kunnen door uh, onbekende technocraten achter gesloten deuren. Central bank digital currencies of eigenlijk in het geval van uh, Europa de digitale euro, dat zijn digitale munten die zijn ontworpen en die worden uitgegeven door de centrale bank. Op dit moment kennen we al digitaal geld. Hè? Dat is uh, vooral uitgegeven en ontworpen door commerciële instellingen, commerciële banken vooral. Wat we tegemoet kunnen zien zijn diensten uh, en digitale munten uitgegeven door de Europese centrale bank, waar commerciële banken niet meer voor nodig zijn. Copia George is a professor at the University of Cape Town and director of the UCT Financial Innovation Lab. As a consultant, he works with central banks worldwide in the development of central bank digital currencies. Central banks are very actively coming together under the umbrella of the Bank for International Settlements, the central bank of central banks, which has launched a financial innovation network and they have sort of different um, fintech hubs in different jurisdictions around the world. And so in this forum, we are developing now this, you know, this new infrastructure. The idea is that you get rid of cash 
you have you know fully digital means of payments and there are ways to you know give people who don't have smartphones access to digital means of payments technology wise you know all of this is currently being developed so it's a matter of time before we see you know those coming into into reality the bank for international settlements in basel switzerland is the central bank of the central banks at its innovation hub it is working hard to roll out the central bank digital currency Agustin Carstens, the general manager of the Bank for International Settlements, released a video statement in October 2020 that raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash, uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who is using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also we will have the technology to enforce that. Those, are, those two issues are extremely important and that makes a huge difference with respect to what, uh, to what cash is. Carsten says that central banks desire absolute control over how the money can be spent. This implies a huge level of control. You have to understand that the Bank of International Settlements was created, and the primary reason it was created was not the stated reason. The primary reason it was created was to create a bank that had sovereign immunity. And since the Hague Convention, they have figured out ways of extending that sovereign immunity around the planet and combine it with sovereign immunities that other organizations have been able to build and get, you know, like the WHO and the UN. And you've created a breakaway civilization that thinks it has sovereign immunity from all national constitutions and basic laws. Catherine Austin Fitz is an American investment banker formerly the managing director of investment bank, Dylan Reed. She was also assistant secretary of housing for the Bush administration in 1988. They have been pushing towards a system that will make the economics of total central control work for them. That's what you have to understand. You've got a group of people who can just print as much money as they want out of thin air, or were able to do it till the commodity producers, you know, had a fit in the last couple months. So as long as you could print money out of thin air and trade it for labor and commodities around the world, you get all the money in the world, right? What, what's important is not money. What's important is controlling real assets. So what I try and do is I get, I try and get the general population all interested and enamored with money while I'm trying to control the real things, including the people. You know, one of the big questions is going to be, will banks exist? Uh, because you can do everything digitally at the central bank. But it also means that the central bankers can dictate the rules of when and how you can use your money. Een belangrijke inhoudelijke wens van de Tweede Kamer hier is dat anoniem betalen mogelijk blijft. Dat privacy goed geborgd is. Dat we niet in een soort systeem van massasurveillance terechtkomen. Of dat er politieke keuzes in het geld zelf worden geprogrammeerd. En de Europese Centrale Bank is hier op dit moment mee bezig. En de Europese Centrale Bank heeft ook laten zien dat zij politieke doelen nastreven. Ook al zijn ze op papier onafhankelijk en dus ook door ons volksvertegenwoordigers dus niet te controleren. Ja, een van die politieke doelen is bijvoorbeeld het tegengaan van klimaatopwarming. Lex Hoogdown teaches economics at the University of Groningen. And is former managing director of the Dutch Central Bank. He says this is a trend that has been going on for a while. Als je ziet waar uh, speeches van ECB-directieleden, uh, die gaan heel vaak over klimaat en niet over, uh, over prijsstabiliteit. He, dus het is ook de, de focus is, uh, is daarmee ook wat weg van prijsstabiliteit. Climate change is one of the biggest economic risks confronting Europe this century. And the rest of the world for that matter. Maar het wordt vrij eng als dat 
in het geld zelf wordt geprogrammeerd. Dan kun je dus te maken hebben met bijvoorbeeld zoiets als een CO2 budget. Wat er nu al is voor het bedrijfsleven. Maar dat zou straks ook maar uh, zomaar kunnen zijn voor huishoudens. Als jij bijvoorbeeld te veel uh, gas gestookt hebt thuis. Dat jij niet meer benzine kunt tanken. Omdat jij al aan je CO2 limiet zit. Je ziet, je ziet nu al dat, dat er in Nederland twee banken zijn. Die zeggen, wij gaan, wij gaan op, de, uh, op uw bankrekening gaan we ook zeggen hoeveel CO2 uitstoot. De producten die u heeft gekocht, kan ik die even met zich meebrengen. Dus het kan zich ook lenen voor het bij elkaar brengen van allerlei data... waarvan de overheid gebruik kan gaan maken in het beleid dat ze wil gaan, uh, gaan voeren. Ja, dan, gaan we, dan gaan we naar een wel heel sterk centraal gestuurde economie... waarin een persoonlijke vrijheid door het putje dreigt te gaan. For some time now, the Dutch banks ING and Rabobank have been working on a payment system that can keep track of the carbon footprint of their customers. And in 2019, Mastercard introduced the first credit card that automatically blocks itself when a set carbon emission quota is exceeded. Since then, we've seen banks across the globe developing such payment systems in partnership with tech startups. Barbara Bashma, CEO of the Rabo Carbo Bank, advocated on Dutch radio for a carbon budget for each Dutch citizen. Als we nou eens iedereen, laten we beginnen in Nederland, die uitstootrechten verdelen en dat elk huishouden of elke burger een hoeveelheid uitstootrechten krijgt, zodat we opgeteld ja, niet meer uitstoten dan onze grens. Vervolgens kunnen we, het zit in een carbon wallet, kan je dat noemen? Kijk bij kopen. Ja, en dan kan je, ik als ik wil vliegen, koop van iemand die uh, uh, niet, uh, niet gaat vliegen, omdat hij daar bijvoorbeeld geen geld voor heeft, die verkoopt aan mij zijn uh, carbon uitstootrechten en krijgt daardoor een beetje meer geld. So Bajma advocates for a transferable carbon budget. But critics warn that such a system could result in ever more inequality. Je zou uh, activiteiten die, uh, als je dan wil gaan vliegen, dan kun je verplicht worden om CO2 te compenseren bijvoorbeeld. En dan wil je dat niet, maar dan gaat het automatisch van je rekening af. Dat soort dingen kun je allemaal digitaal inbouwen. De mogelijkheden zijn eindeloos. En daarmee is je democratie en je recht op bezit, waarbij jij jezelf iets hebt opgebouwd en dat jij rechten afstaat aan de overheid om iets te doen met een stukje belasting bijvoorbeeld. Dat is weg. Alles wat jij verdient is zichtbaar, belastbaar uh, en programmeerbaar voor overheden en centrale banken. Er zijn, er zijn mensen die zeggen, zo'n digital currency kun je ook heel goed gebruiken. Die, daar kun je gewoon de rente op, negatief op, uh, op zetten. As soon as all payments run through a central bank, it could be possible to reduce interest rates to below 0%. Annual reports of the ECB show this to be a recurring topic for discussion. De centrale bank die heft dan belasting, vermogensbelasting eigenlijk op jouw spaartegoeden, kan dat naar eigen inzicht uitgeven. Het is voor jou een last hè? als jij negatieve rente hebt, dat is gewoon geld dat van jouw rekening afgaat. Nou, dat gaat naar een andere instantie toe. Dus de centrale bank had altijd een heel beperkt en duidelijk mandaat. Maar die centrale bank die wordt steeds politieker en politieker en politieker. En die, die eigent zichzelf het recht toe om belasting te heffen. En dan krijg je dus een situatie dat je belasting heft zonder democratische verantwoording. Dat is geen vooruitgang. Dan ga je terug in de tijd. To me, there's no more important issue because without a national sovereignty, you're going to lose individual sovereignty. So this war is going to come down to individual and national sovereignty. And with it, can you have, can the central bankers implement taxation without representation. And of course, their way to do it is to end currencies with, they call it a currency, CBDC. But it's not a currency, it's a control grid. It's a control grid that will permit them to run things centrally with AI and software and to tax without representation. And it, it, if they get their way, they will destroy not only all national sovereignty, they'll destroy all individual sovereignty. staan van contant geld zorgt ervoor dat niet in digitaal geld voorgeprogrammeerd is dat die negatieve rentes automatisch van kracht kunnen raken omdat iedereen dan altijd nog de mogelijkheid heeft om het geld contant op te nemen en dat is een belangrijk goed die, uh, die keuzemogelijkheid in recent years the use of cash has seen an enormous decline in 2021 research carried out by the Dutch Central Bank showed that before the pandemic, 32% of all purchases were made using cash. During the pandemic, 
this dropped to a mere 20 percent. Brett Scott is an author and self-described financial hacker. In search of material for his books, he has immersed himself in the world of the City of London. In his most recent book, Cloud Money, he writes about the war on cash and the dangers of a cashless society. Many big players for quite a long time have been engaging in this war on cash, trying to push you away from the cash system slowly but surely. But when COVID came along, they really used COVID as an excuse to accelerate that process. A good example is the example of Visa and the NFL, actually. So Visa entered into the deal with the NFL to make their Super Bowls go cashless in 2019, before the pandemic, but they implemented it in 2020. And the narrative that was built around that was, was, was that it was because of the pandemic. In reality, though, um, major health bodies like the Robert Koch Institute in Germany, which is a preeminent health uh, research institute, have come out and said there's no connection between cash and COVID. In fact, they've pointed out that things like self-checkout touchscreens and the pin pads of these card terminals are a greater threat of spreading COVID than cash is. And what's really interesting is that in places like London right now, a lot of these big retailers use it as an excuse for, quote unquote, going cashless. But now a lot of the other COVID regulations have been dropped in places like London. You don't have to wear a mask anywhere. And yet the retailers are still claiming that cash transmits COVID and they're still using it as an excuse to stay with this, these digital payment systems. Um, and it starts to essentially shame people for using the cash system. But if you think about it, the cash system is the only thing that stands between you and corporate domination of the payment system. Als commerciële banken dan ook nog eens allemaal geldautomaten gaan weghalen, bankfilialen gaan sluiten en um, ja, ook nog eens, dat is een laatste trend, geld in rekening uh, gaan brengen bij mensen die contant geld willen uh, opnemen, ja, dan wordt het nog onaantrekkelijker dan het al was, dat contante geld. On the subject of the digital euro, let me also underline that we all agree that it should not replace but complement cash. Thank you very much. That's the first slide. Nou, als je eerlijk bent, je hebt dat rapport hè, van de ECB on the digital currency. Um, en daar staat inderdaad letterlijk in dat die uh, CBDC, je moet cash-like features krijgen, uh, zodat hij hetzelfde kan doen als cash. En als je dat dan introduceert en je wil graag dat mensen dat hebben, dan gaat dat ten koste van de behoefte aan cash. Die twee die, twee die bijten elkaar. Contant geld zal niet uh, hard meteen verdwijnen. Elk dorp in Nederland zal voorlopig nog wel een pinautomaat hebben. Alleen wat je ermee kan doen zal veel, veel minder zijn. Dus het zal dan op minder plekken worden geaccepteerd. Dus dan is het dus niet helemaal weg, maar dan wordt het gewoon langzaam aan verdrongen. Je ziet tegelijkertijd uh, dat de cryptocurrencies die zullen meer en meer gereguleerd worden. Dus een als er op een gegeven moment geen alternatief is voor het, het geld van de centrale bank... Ja, dat, dat, is, dat is toch een gevaarlijke wereld als de, als de macht in verkeerde handen komt. Daarom is het ook goed om er nu al bewust te zijn van wat we hier aan het creëren zijn. En ons niet uh, zeggen van ja, dit gaat maar om iets kleins enzovoort. Als er eenmaal is, ja, dan, kan het, dan is het veel moeilijker om er dan nog... Greep op te krijgen. Geld wordt programmeerbaar, traceerbaar en manipuleerbaar. En dat kan vele dilemma's en gevaren opleveren in de samenleving. Het is heel moeilijk voor volksvertegenwoordigers, zoals ik, om een uh, precies beeld te krijgen waar ze nu achter gesloten deuren mee bezig zijn. Wij hebben hier uh, in Nederland, na veel aandringen van de regering, een standpunt gekregen over de digitale euro. Een van die punten is dat ook de Nederlandse regering, dus niet alleen het Nederlands parlement, maar ook de regering is van mening dat de digitale euro niet programmeerbaar moet zijn. Maar het Europese proces en de Europese bureaucratie werkt zo dat dat nog niet automatisch leidt tot daadwerkelijk een digitale euro die niet programmeerbaar is. Wij kunnen hier van alles besluiten als Tweede Kamer, maar als je dit soort ingrijpende beslissingen überhaupt niet meer overlaat aan democratische besluitvorming, maar dat het ergens in de achterkamers wordt besloten, dan maak je de democratie zelf minder relevant. Op dit moment worden de belangrijke beslissingen genomen. Alleen niet in de openbaarheid, achter gesloten deur. 
that the financial system connected to a digital identity can be used as a means for power and control is no longer news. China has been rolling out a social credit system since 2009, which judges the behavior of citizens using a score system. Since the pandemic, we've seen the Chinese authorities ramping up surveillance and big data to control citizens. The powerful Chinese COVID tracking system, linked to a digital ID, was also used to prevent protests. In May of 2022, in Henan province in China, there was a bank protest that was being planned and everyone who was going to this protest, all of a sudden their travel documents were turning red, as in they cannot pass this border, they cannot go and travel to the planned protest. And because everything was digitalized, they just received a warning from the government that you cannot take your money out because you protested against the, the COVID measures and you know, you're not entitled anymore to your own money. The way the social credit system works is that if Chinese citizens behave in a manner deemed inappropriate by the authorities, they lose points and are automatically blacklisted, losing them certain rights and privileges. These far-reaching systems of control that impose travel restrictions on citizens or freeze bank accounts were, until recently, something that could only occur in authoritarian regimes. Until 2022, when the bank accounts of protesting citizens were also blocked in Canada. You had in Canada, had you had protests against Trudeau, against the Premier, um, and there were truckers who were not all not with the certain vaccine policy. Dus die gingen ook wat blokkeren en er was er een crowdfunding gestart om die truckers wat te helpen, zodat ze ook bij een blokkade eten kregen en een dekentje en weet ik wat. Toen heeft de regering gezegd van wij zijn het niet eens met zo'n crowdfunding en uh, die hebben toen rekeningen van mensen geblokkeerd uh, en ook bepaalde crowdfunding sites uh, ja, gewoon ongeldig verklaard. In een attempt to end the blockades in Ottawa, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau used an ultimate means of power, the Emergency Act from 1988. This enabled the government to block the bank accounts of the truckers and their sponsors. Canadians perceived this action as a power grab by a totalitarian government. Due to heavy criticism, Trudeau was eventually forced to unfreeze the accounts. But it did show that even in a Western democracy, the digital financial system can be used as a far-reaching means of control. At the moment, it's already quite easy for governments to use the financial system to, you know, impose sanctions, to block truckers from receiving payments because they disagree on their political ideology or they disagree on the form of protest. So we already have those means. Um, the question is whether a central bank digital currency makes it easier to do this. And I think the answer is yes. Technology-wise, if you are if you have a more efficient currency, the risk of abuse um, is also there. And what you nu dus al ziet gebeuren is dat, dat overheden zichzelf het recht willen kunnen geven om bepaalde acties gewoon niet eens van de grond te laten komen. En als je dat doortrekt naar CBDC, ja, dan zou je kunnen zeggen, nou, met CBDC is het onmogelijk om bijvoorbeeld. Uh, een bepaald type uh, protestacties te financieren. En dan wordt jouw geld wordt dus heel politiek. Implementation of that type of techn technocracy becomes that much more easy when everything is digitized, including our identities, and when that is tied into our bank accounts. So we really are at a precipice. And I wonder how much of the population really understands the, the gravity of what, we're, what it is we're facing. And unfortunately, there are no proper safeguards yet to, to avoid something like that. Uh, we receive assurances from Commission and from others that something like this will not happen. But I don't buy that. Because here's the problem. When you create a law, you have to think at the worst case scenario. You never know down the road after the law is passed. Who's going to come in power and use that law in a bad way? If things were to go badly and a government be elected that is more draconian, more authoritarian than we, ha we have been used to in the West since World War II, then that means that our digital ID will be wide open to abuse, to surveillance, uh, to predation, 
and, you know, potentially, as the Nazis did, arrest and deportation. Um, it would make it so much easier for any ill-minded government to do that in any of our countries. This is exactly as it happened in communism. In Marxism, they said, no, people do not have rights. They have privileges granted by the government. So as long as you comply with what the government says, they will grant you those privileges. If you don't comply, or if you are an, an enemy of the state, for example, they will take those privileges away from you. And slowly we see this kind of mentality being implemented in the, in the European Union right now. Because from a mentality, slowly but surely, they will implement us into laws. And that is the ideology of technocracy, which is essentially a quest to transition humanity from the beautiful, messy state of organic nature into humanity 2.0, where everyone will be tracked, traced, and databased everywhere they go at all times, and can then be fed into algorithms which will be able to uh, determine the best course for society. Think of this as a, as a financial control grid, okay? And all you have to do, you've been building it, and you've been building the infrastructure and the smart grid to build it, you only need to add two last pieces, and then it snaps into a digital concentration camp. The problem is these people behave like they are gods, that we have to trust them and we should not question them just because they are in power. Well, because they are in power, we have to question them. Because power corrupts, power anywhere corrupts. This is the reason why us as citizens and you guys as journalists, you always have to keep an eye on what someone in power is doing. Als je kijkt naar de relatie tussen burger en overheid, ik vind dat het een burgerplicht is om een overheid te wantrouwen. Dat is eigenlijk het hele idee van democratie. Maar wij hebben op dit moment al een, een samenleving en een architectuur gecreëerd waarin dat wantrouwen wordt georganiseerd richting de burger. Daar zijn we nu al en dan moeten we nu de bankiers gaan vertrouwen over wat er met het geld gaat gebeuren. En daar mogelijkheden worden ingebouwd om onze vrijheid nog verder gaande mate te beperken. Dat is eigenlijk geen goed idee. The technical developments are gaining a momentum that we have not experienced before. With exponential growth, driven by large profits of tech giants and a centralist appetite for control by central bankers, huge steps are being taken to build a technocratic network around us. The democratic process seems barely capable of keeping up with these developments, and our freedom and privacy are at stake. This places us in a grey area. Because the question arises, how much are we prepared to surrender our privacy and our freedom for convenience? And what can we do to channel this movement to our benefit? I think people need to start looking for and leveraging all of those things that they can do to detach themselves from a system of technocratic control. And what that means in specific terms, I think, is creating and fostering communities of interest where people will be able to voluntarily and independently choose to come together to interact on the things that they want to accomplish, rather than being put into systems where you have no choice, you are simply another cog in the machine that is being constructed. Technology wordt ook vaak uh, op een soort deterministische manier ge gepresenteerd, hè, van ja, weet je, dit is gewoon hoe het gaat. Maar dat is natuurlijk de grootste leugen, want als er iets maakbaar is, is het technologie. Maar je kan wel degelijk in de fase van het ontwerp van die technologie, kan je fundamentele keuzes maken. En op basis van die fundamentele keuzes kan je ervoor zorgen dat bijvoorbeeld de privacy van burgers beschermd blijft. Kan je ervoor zorgen dat uitsluiting niet mogelijk wordt gemaakt of heel, mo heel moeilijk mogelijk wordt gemaakt. Door middel van technologie kun je juist veel beter op dit moment decentraal organiseren. Uh, samenwerkingen uh, op andere manieren in gaan vullen en uh, de technologie ten goede gebruiken om meer vrijheid, meer vertrouwen en meer liefde in de samenleving te uh, bewerkstelligen. We moeten wel naar verandering en daar staan we ook op het punt, maar we kunnen naar een hele positieve verandering. Ja, en die komt vanuit onszelf en niet vanuit geld, macht en ego. You know, if tomorrow everybody woke up and said, I'm going to pull all my money out of every systemically important bank 
You can't, there would be a revolution tomorrow. It would be fabulous. So the first thing we can all do is for God's sakes, take the system analog as much as you can. So whether it's using cash or getting rid of your smartphone, just get out of the digital system. You should be asserting your right to use cash. You should be challenging any shop owners that prevent you from doing it. You should also be challenging any authorities that prevent you from doing it. So for example, in Amsterdam, the tram system will prevent you from using cash. Many places will prevent you from using cash. You should be standing up against that, saying, hey, this is actually not a good move. This is not in our interests. And even if you think it might save you know, a bit of time and so on, in the long term, this is bad for our economic system. So obviously that means a, a rejection of systems that try to catalog and reduce human nature down to a digital ID, a biometric face scan or fingerprint or something along those lines, and more towards natural, organic, uh, lived humanity of face-to-face -face interactions. We are clearly at a crossroads in history. A crisis is forming that we cannot yet foresee. And the call for a new system and a new form of society is greater than ever before. But the question is whether this should be a centralist, tech-driven society, or whether we can use this technology to work together in a decentralized way for a sustainable world. With guaranteed privacy, self-determination, and freedom. Do you believe they will eventually succeed? No, I think they're going to fail. I really think they're going to fail. You cannot run a complex system with this much top-down control because it's going to break down and it's going to make a mess. It's too antithetical to how intelligence and resources work on this planet. It's just simply incompatible with life. <laughs>